it seems like one of the main conversations people have when they're in Minnesota is the weather. The weather. And so let me show you this message at 640, 639 in the morning when I was wheeling myself out of the hotel. It was a friend from Cambodia. She said, OMG, how perfect is this weather tonight? She thought I was still in Cambodia, where it's 83. <laughs> and it's going down to 76. And I was like, girl, I got like 20 <laughs> layers of Japanese technology underwear under here. I mean, I am a walking uh, clothing drive. <laughs> But I, just like the, you have the land acknowledgement here, I want to do a student acknowledgement. But my sessions are always interactive because I'm an interactive teacher. Um, so I like to do this game with you. I like you to, with a partner, say hello in as many languages as possible. Here are some choices. These are the, of, the from um, ranking of um, the majority to the, the top majorities of students in uh, Minnesota. So. Turn talk to your partners when you finish. High five, so let me know that you're done. Go. Buenos dias. Finish in five, cuatro, tres, dos, uno, son. I start that always because I always want to, we, we come here for this one purpose, not just to go to the Mall of America, but we come here because we are, we're here for the students who are not here in this room. We're here for the parents who are not here in this room. We're here for the colleagues who are not here in this room. Okay. And for that, I thank you. But we, also, but we also have to thank a group of really dedicated teachers and organizers here, Dr. Amy Young, Dr. Patty Lagos, Dr. Kate, Jeanette, Michael, and Michelle, including Jim, Jeff, and uh, Jill over there who've been a doing AV. So they have worked for a year to run three days. And the food yesterday was amazing. There was like free flowing wine and desserts, and it was so good. When I get on the plane, I'm not going to be eating because I don't need to eat anymore because I came here. So please make sure you say hello and thank you for them for the, uh, at the conference. They brought us all here today. And when I got this invitation in April of last year, I was like, yes, mom, I got another one. <laughs> and I, but the second I send the email to say yes, I'm always like, I really shouldn't be here. Because statistically, I should be dead somewhere between the Gulf of Thailand and the South China Sea. Because we were one of the last migrant, uh, last boat people. Nine out of 10 boats do not make it. The majority, they're capsized and they have to swim back. They can swim back. They're captured and they're put into re-education camps and then they're blacklisted for life. We were one of the lucky tens that made it. On the seventh day of our trip, we, the engine died. On the eighth day, whew, sorry. On the eighth day, um, the adults decided to stop eating food and to give it to us. Whew. Okay, I can do this. Um, and we survived. And then we, on the ninth day, the Malaysian um, Coast Guard came and picked us up and rescued us and brought us to the Philippines where my mother sells pho on the side. Right? So this is me on the quivering next to my sister, my, older, my second older brother. My mom takes the rations that she gets, saves them, and sells uh, pho on the side. 
very industrious people. Right? This is the photo that was put into the Lutheran um, magazine that, that went around the US. And the Lutheran community, I'm always indebted to the Lutheran community, said, we want to sponsor this family. They paid for our tickets. They uh, asked for a host family to support us. And we arrived and we landed in Philadelphia. This is the last day in the Philippines. This is the teary goodbye of saying, I'll see you later. I'll send money. Don't forget us. We'll write often. You're not left behind. Right? And then this is the first day, on September 15th, where we made, we stepped foot in the US and, and our forever home. And somehow in between there was like a wardrobe change. <laughs> kind of cute. I had like a Taylor Swift moment, apparently. <laughs> But when we came to America, we tried to find ways to be American, such as Christmas, though we're Buddhist. Do you see the hand waving? Who do you think it's pointing at? Yeah, it's like, stop, don't open that. Take a picture first. <laughs> I'm one of those kids. Okay. We had snow days where we learned, don't eat yellow snow. <laughs> we learned uh, how to bike there, many firsts. We've had. Um, when we, and I look here, right? <laughs> I'm not so cute. When we, this is second hand, and any time we have a purchase, even if it was second hand, it was so precious because it meant that we made it. We especially had roast pigs, roast anything when we got a car, even with second hand. The uncles would come by, and the aunts would cook for them, and then we would have lots of beer flowing for the whole day. We had really good picture days and not so bad good ones. <laughs> we, just like Americans, we try to uh, go on vacations that we can't afford. And yet we try to keep our values, like forcing our kids to dress in things they don't want to. <laughs> this was our Lunar New Year kotat. We also kept values of like gambling. <laughs> Child labor. <laughs> and this is me, like, really working with my mom. I said, Maya, Maya, which means mom. I said, Maya, can I have an allowance? My mom go, what that? <laughs> Another toy, no toy, no toy. Ma, it's not an allowance. It's like you pay me, you know, I'm working for you. You pay me for the, for the things that I'm working for. Do you, have you ever had that moment with the thing you're saying? And you're like, uh, you need to stop? And you can't? And that was that moment. She said, what? What the hell? <laughs> you want me pay you money? Make clothes, wash dishes, vacuum? Mm-mm. No. You lucky I give you life. <laughs> I allow you this. I allow you not to die on the street tonight. Now go work. OK, mom. <laughs> One of the biggest values, though, that was given to us was the value of education. My mom said, we sacrifice everything so that you could have an education. Did you, this is my first grade teacher. I love first grade so much, I went twice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a kindergarten teacher, sorry. Do you, do you notice, uh, Miss Phyllis right here, do you notice why I was strategically sat next to her? I'm one of those kids. <laughs> I think I invented ADD and was the inspiration for Ritalin. <laughs> she was in close person, maybe she needed to like wrap my neck, like stop, because I'm one of those kids. But the whole time, I would speak Vietnamese to her like she was a Vietnamese mother, and she would speak back to me in English. We had no idea what we were saying, but we felt there was so much love. Right? That's all I remember about her. We saw this education, we were modeled it by um, uh, like temple, not, uh, churches in the local community giving um, the refugees uh, free education at e in the evening. So my mom worked two jobs, and then like, she made sure she had time in the evening to go to the, to the uh, Vietnamese schools, uh, English schools. She brought us along, and these are the village elders. And the way to thank them at the end of the course was to have this beautiful feast of egg rolls and chicken feet and intestines of every kind. It was delicious. <laughs> The teacher didn't eat much, though. <laughs> we had milestones 
as immigrants and refugees. This was my, this is my second brother. He finally graduated high school, but like many of your students, he decided not to go to university because he wanted to stay and uh, work to help the family because we were really quite poor. We had other milestones. When my sister graduated from, Dick, uh, from Drexel University, on the graduation day, my, my, my mom said, Aya, today, first daughter graduate. Now I can die happy. I see Buddha tonight. I said, Mom, I, I'm just starting college. You have four more years. <laughs> you can't say that. <laughs> so I want you to please turn and talk to your partners to talk about how was my immigrant story different or soon? more similar to the experience of your own students. Please start and talk now. Thank you. สี่สามสองหนึ่งเขาขนนะครับ Thank you I speak multiple languages so I'm going to model how I teach so uh, when I count down for students sometimes I'll count in Khmer sometimes I'll count down in Spanish sometimes I'll count in Thai so I'm just modeling for you for that okay? so what are some of the experiences that you're you probably have said that resilience caring parents caring families, sharing values, determination. Right? Some of the things that are very similar. I'd like to share with you three stories that your MLs might experience. Right? So this is EMC in Southerton. This is my second elementary school, the one that I stayed in the most. I entered ESL there in first grade and I stayed in ESL until fourth grade. I exited, a, oh, the system was pulled out, so we, there were random times where I was pulled out, and I had like, we played games, and we like had cards, and we had to find the monkey, and I had to like play different games. It was fun, I enjoyed it. And then I reclassified out as grade five, right? So I was the typical success story, yes, you've made it, right? So, but there was one time that I still clearly still remember in fifth grade when the teacher said, go, it's time to read. Go read your book. And then I was like, okay, I didn't really like reading. I, found, I tried to find the shortest, smallest book with the biggest print. Oh, some of your students too? Okay. Um, and this is the text. I, I also liked it because I, I'm Buddhist and it's Asian and it's the closest connection because I'm like, I'm done with reading about pilgrims. Thank you. Um, <laughs> And so I found something closely, close, uh, closer connected to my culture and I started reading it. 96 pages, grades three to seven, I should be able to read it. Ages two to eight to 12, Lexhow a thousand and Fanantas and Penel S. Let me read you the text. Once upon a time, a far, away, far away in Japan, a poor young artist sat alone in his little house waiting for his dinner. His housekeeper had gone to the market and he sat sighing to think of all the things he had wished she would bring, him, bring home. I'll stop there. But as a fifth grader, I did not know. I could decode every single word. But I could not tell you at the end who was in the story and what were they doing, what they want, where are they. Right? This is very typical. And I would just, I would silently read like, and I would once in a while like, <laughs> 
And like, I would fake read. Now, your kids are good at that, right? Your kids are good at that. So that's one story where like, I should have been, I, should, I exited ESL and I should have been fluent and proficient in my grade. I no longer need a support, but yet why can't I read a grade level five text? So next story, I'm, this is grade 11 and I have to apply for the SATs. And at that time, it was 600, um, 1600 for a perfect score, 800 in math, 800 um, evidence-based reading, writing. I'm like, oh my goodness, I went through public school education from K to 12 and my public school was like very affluent. So it has lots of resources. Guess what score I got? Turn and talk to your partners, guess what score? Okay, can you, can you tell me what scores you think I got? 950, what else? 400, oh, that's cute. Oh. What else? 1200, you're like my mom, you really believe in me, thanks. When I opened the, I opened the envelope, I got, I saw this, 910. My mom was like, oh honey, what you got? Mm-mm, ma'am, it's okay. Uh, they said I should go back and retest in a few months. 9, 10, 60 years percentile. How is this possible from going from a fantastic blue ribbon school from K to 12 and I have only 910? It's, here's the reason why. Because I sound fluent. But yet my academic English wasn't there. I was passed on because I sounded, and I am fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, mm -mm. Hey, me, it's the test. Mm -mm. So I said, I'm going to try the ACT like my, like my counselor told me to. And 36 is the total points. And here, I was like, OK, I'll just try it again. What score do you think I got? Oh, you're kind. 16. 16. Oh. 19. Yay, bingo. Again, how is this possible? I took a test that's very different. But how is it possible that I got 60th percentile again? Right? So there here are actual consequences. Colleges that I want to apply at 1,200 now closed. Scholarships that I wanted to apply to now are no longer allowed. I couldn't access them anymore. Right? And I couldn't charm my way through the test like I could from K to 12. Right? My academics, my social, uh, my um, like being part of the tennis team drama, being part of student council didn't help me through this. It was purely academics. So my professor, my college counselor said, uh, you should apply not to these schools. You should apply somewhere else that doesn't um, take uh, SATs. I was like, Harvard doesn't take SATs? He's like, mm-hmm, no child. You're gonna look at something else. <laughs> And I found something close enough where my mom can't get me that evening, but far enough for me to, easy enough for me to get back into state. Right? So Dickinson College. It's a phenomenal school. It's 46 in liberal arts, 44 in best value schools, 36 in best undergraduate teaching. It's one in a third, 33% uh, of the students are accepted. The rest are not. It's very highly competitive. And I was given the diversity award because I was Gay from a single family, Buddhist, poor. I could, like, I could, I ticked everything. They're like, yes, how many more scholars can you be? How many more things can you be? I'm like, so they gave me an $80,000 scholarship. But the requirement was I had to keep it at a 3.0 GPA, right? And I took almost, I took all courses, and then the, well, I had one last course was a sophomore course, and I was like, <gasps> Uh, and I went to my college professor who was a counselor and I said, um, I'm really scared of taking this, but this is the only one that fits my schedule. What, what do you think? He's like, it's gonna be hard. You're, you're taking a sophomore course. You have to take it anyways. Good luck. And so, uh, hey, thanks. Um, I took the course and in mid-October, uh, I had progress reports. Everything was passing except for this one. The professor said, can you please come to me during my office hours? And I was like, that's never a good invitation. Um, so I went and I said, what's going on? What's wrong? And he said, you're failing the class. You're close to failing because it's, it's not working out. I said, I don't know what to do. What can I do? He said, How, are you reading the text? I said, yes, I read the text. I flip the pages. He's like, 
Mm -hmm. Can I see your text? I said, I took it out of my school bag, and this is what he saw. Just a blank text, nothing on it. And then he reached over to his wall, and he, he, said, he said, let me show you how I read as an academic. I read like this. I stop and I pause. I write little notes. I write little annotations. So I'm processing content. So, and then he said, your job is to go home tonight, and this is a Friday evening. He said, go home tonight and just read the book back again. And I did. I went back, and I didn't party that night. <sighs> uh, and then, I don't really party anyways. Uh, I'm a nerd. So I went home and I just read, and read, and read, and read. And I kept doing this throughout. And by the end of November, um, I, I mean, we checked in again, and by the end of the course in September, I got a B in that course w from failing. Right? And this is because this was the first, this is the second time only in my academic life that someone taught me how to annotate, how to read academic texts. So that's, that was reading. Let me go to writing. So my, prof my other professor, he started looking at my writing. He said, ooh, Tan, listen, it's a hot mess. You, can you go to the writing center and just go and take your paper and just make sure you have someone talk to you about it through it? I was like, okay, sure, not a problem. I'll, I'll be diligent, do whatever you want. I went, and then the person walked me through. He's like, where's your thesis statement? I said, what's a, what's a thesis statement? I never was taught a thesis statement, even though I was in AP English. Right? I was never, and, I, and it, one time I showed him my, my research, he's like, where are you getting this research? Oh, I'm, getting, I'm just getting it from the abstract. He's like, you're not reading the articles? I'm like, the abstract is the article. <laughs> he's like, oh baby, no. I was like, no one taught me this. Right? And so this was the first time someone actually walked me through the structure of writing a paragraph, writing an essay. How does in-text citate? That's something that I've never was taught. Right? Let me show you. So my, here is my actual uh, undergrad, uh, what is this called? Transcript. I graduated in 2007, sociology in Spanish. Si yo hablo español, pero había un tiempo que no hablo, entonces mi español is not very good looking. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I graduated with honors. Honors cum laude, thank you. My mom was proud. <laughs> and I got like really cheap bling for it, the tassel things. And I thought that's because I hung out with the really attractive nerds at my school. We were all like highly accomplished people at our school. If you want something done at your school, you went to this group. And I thought, of course, I'm highly successful. I have honors, my friends, I only hung out with the nerds. So I graduated and I went to Teach for America. And I was so honored to go there. They put me in New Orleans, which is like, oh, if a city could be in drag, it would be New Orleans. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Decadent, beautiful, confident, and reassured. Beautiful, right? And then I had to take this thing, the praxis. Mm-hmm, right? Woo, Lord, let me tell you this. <laughs> oh, Lord. You ready? Let's look at this. The only reason, I'll just go back. The only reason I got my highest score in a principles to uh, learning pedagogy was I, like senior year, I stopped everything. Because the TFA was like, you have to take this praxis test. You have to, like, you have to pass this or you don't get placement. So I went and got like the praxis, practice test for principles for dummies. And I just like read and read and annotated and tried to figure it out. And I got like, I, I cheated the system, right? But let's look at other things like, English language composition, the score was 160. My English language lit composition was 161, one score above passing. Let's look at uh, reading, reading. 172 is the minimum. My score was 175, and I have honors cum laude. I hang out with the sexy nerds. How is this possible, right? And then, like, look at my writing. 171 was the minimum, 177. How is this possible that you graduated from a prestigious college, that you went through public school education, K to 12, and you still are not proficient academically? Why is that? So 
I'll give you the answer. And that, that's not because of my professors, that's not because of my teachers, they were loving and they were caring, but because I sounded fluent, they stopped teaching me specifically, ex ex uh, explicitly, right? So turn and talk to your partner. Think about a socially high-performing, fabulous student like me that has underdeveloped academic language. Turn and talk, what commonality, what commonality does that student have with my experience? Turn and talk to your partners, please. Pram, buồn, bay, pi, mui, son. That was Kamai counting down for you. Okay. So I was, at that time, should be considered a long-term academic language learner. Here, who are experienced multilinguals? Who, let's look at just multilinguals in, as an umbrella. There are different categories such as English learners, dual language, never identified English learner, former English learner, uh, AL, people who have classified out. And these are, the these are like descriptions of them. And then we're gonna look at one particular long-term English learners, uh, MLs who are not reclassified for the past four years. This session is for them, and all my workshops are for them uh, this afternoon, today and this afternoon. So let's look at Minnesota, provided by Michael uh, the, and his data, his team of data. 80,000 MLs in Minnesota. Woo, Woo 22 that are long-term English learners, and then 27 of that, that's 27%, that's almost a third of your students who are MLs who are long-term English learners. I know that newcomers is, a, is a, a wave that you're experiencing, but they get, like, after, after they no longer become a newcomer, what happens to them? My experience is what happens to them. Doors close, right? So let's look more. So what takes so long? Well, here, Dr. Cummings said that there is BICS and CALP. So BICS is basic interpersonal communication skills. It takes dos años to arrive there, right? So words such like playground, pencil, computer, laptop, lunch, those things are easy. You can point to them. You learn them very quickly. I have BICS in multiple languages, but I only have CALP in two, one and a half, including English. <laughs> So CALP is this, Cognitive Academic Language Proficiency, which means it takes five to siete años to get there with explicit instruction, not just showing up and being part of class. You have to teach, we have to teach, not you, we have to teach academic English explicitly. There's a structure for that, right? So let me give you an example. Here are your beginners, newcomers. Let's say that they're doing an experiment in grade nine. And they have, this is an actual experiment my students did in, in my school. Pondweed, water, lamp, they talked about it. They adjusted the intensity of the light, and then they, they saw um, how many bubbles were produced. So they, this is what they say, much bubble. Experienced multilinguals, there were more things when the light was bigger, when the light was brighter. Technically correct, but not ac academically proficient. This is what I needed to be taught, to sound like a scientist. When the light intensity increase, subordinate conjunction, the rate of photosynthesis increase as evident by a greater production of bubbles. This is the kind of language. When we see MLs and we're like, oh baby, po 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 pericito, you, got a, you had a rough life, okay, you got the answer correctly, let's move on. That's not enough. 
we have to show them how to speak the language of access. Dr. Michelle Benigas, you will get there later, okay? A home ground hero, Dr. Amy and Dr. Michelle Benigas and Natalia have also written the book coming up soon about a language in literacy, it's a language of identity, the language of access, and so how do you bring both of them together? Hang out, look out for that. So why is long-term so problematic? Like think about some terms that have the word long-term, like long-term investments, long-term relationships, lifelong learner, right? All these are really positive. Um, like long-distance relationship, no wait, that doesn't work. Those are things are bad. Save your money, save your tears, save the flights that are delayed, don't do it. <laughs> so here, when we think about long-term English learners, we, I consider it a deficit term. Because we're saying they're unmotivated, they're struggling, the slow process, and there's like low performing kids. I don't understand, I understand them fully, what's wrong with them? This is what the US Department of Education has shared. This is from Dr. Um, Debbie Zakarian, fabulous educator, a scholar. She said, MLs are more likely to be identified as having a learning disability or speech impediment, and they're most likely to drop out. And they're less likely to be served in regular classes, meaning they're pulled out of mainstream classes to be put into like a closet and to learn. And then they graduate, and they're more less likely to graduate with a diploma. Let's see what M Michigan looks like. Minnesota, Minnesota, hi, Minnesota. Four years ago, <laughs> four years ago, graduation rates in Minnesota, all students, 83%. With ML status, EL status, 65 was slight, 45. It gets a little better with seven years. All students, 89. Students with LL status, 79. And students with SLIFE, 64. They are underperforming, undergraduating, and they are being, let's look at something else. Let's look at the National Center for Education Statistics. I searched up how many students have disabilities who are receiving service. In Minnesota, it's 70, 17%. Look at the neighboring states, very similar in the teens. Take a guess on how many MLs are considered in the population of special ed. More or less? More. 34%. Double. 34. Don't worry, I'm not finger pointing at Minnesota because South Carolina does too, PA has it as well. Most states have this experience. They over identify their kids who are like, I don't understand, he speaks really well. They can, they can understand me, but there's something wrong with them. Let's put them in learning support. Some of them do have that, yes. But why is it over representation? Right? So let's look here. So what should we replace with long-term English learners? Experience, multilinguals. Yes, yes. So what words are associated with people who, are, who have dedicated years to achieving a goal, such as Serena and Venus Williams, who started playing at five? Or Nicholas McCarthy, the only one-hand concert pianist, started when he was 14. Can you turn and talk to your partners and say, what words come to your mind when you think about people who have dedicated the quote-unquote 10,000 hours to something? Turn and talk to your partners. Bom, ba, hi, mop, thank you. That's counting down in um, Vietnamese. This side over here, can you give me some words for people who have dedicated years? Expert, Expert. Gifted. gifted, over here. Hardworking. What? Driven. Driven. Hardworking. 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 Tenacity. Tenacity. Perseverance. Perseverance. Love. Love. Support, a brilliant, accomplished, thank you. <laughs> you can keep going. So 
We're moving to experienced multilinguals because it's more asset-based. These are what your experienced multilinguals can do. They possess at least one other linguistic and cultural background. They're capable of learning grade-level content with mainstream, thank you, PSYOP. They are able, they have five years of experience in English medium schools. They are not slight kids. They know what a bell schedule is. They know that they have to change in PE uniforms. You don't have to teach them what schooling is, right? You can use their entire linguistic repertoire. So here's me. You can see it's sixth grade. You can see the gigantic pimple. <laughs> Here are things when I am as uh, experienced multilingual, things what I was doing in sixth grade. I was translating medical appointments and business transactions for my family. My mom took me to the bank with a tray of egg rolls to do banking transactions, right? I can think in two languages. I can integrate cultural traditions from both. I can share you about my migration experience, government work, slavery, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, uh, child labor, and Buddhism. I participated in band, choir, uh, safety guard, and student council. I was familiar with elementary, middle, and school schedules. These are all of my assets. These are all of your students' assets. Can you turn and talk to your partner and think about the assets of your students? What are their lived experiences? What are the linguistic assets? What are the cultural assets? Turn and talk to your partners, please. Five, four, three, song, nung. Kop chai la lai. Can I hear from this side? Give me something that's, a, that's an asset from one of your students. Give me one of your assets from one of your students. Connections? Yes. Multitasking. Multitasking, so good at that. Understanding political systems. Advanced kid. Caregiving. Caregiving, yes. They take care of their kids. Yeah, their brothers and sisters, yes. There are survivors. What are the experiences here? What? Tenacity. They have a lot of tenacity. These are all of their assets. Right? So, what kind of instructions do experienced multilinguals need to move from phase three to phase six? Because on the WIDA, it says near native peer fluency. How do we do that? Well, the answer already exists within WIDA, PSYOP, and Understanding by Design. I have just put it together conveniently in a book for you. Thank you for buying it with a special code. It's 21% off. And thank you for purchasing it because you're funding my dog's college tuition. My goal was for him to go to Harvard. <laughs> don't worry, it's okay. I'm, you don't have to buy it because I don't, I don't need more money. I have a sugar daddy. Uh, <laughs> and if I, I, don't, I only make $2 on this very special code. It's, and the $2 gets split between me and Beth Skelton, a fabulous author, my co-author. And then I get taxed on that dollar, right? It's, <laughs> If I wanted more money, I can go work at Zara and get the company discount and look fierce every single season. <laughs> okay? So I don't really need, it's not about purchasing the money, it's, a, it's getting the money, it's about changing a system and being more equitable for students with this. This, pro, this system that we've done is we started with thinking about planning backwards at the orchard level. Then thinking about the individual trees when we think about the individual trees of a lesson, we think about how do we make it comprehensible, such as trees need sun and rain. And at the end, we need to structure the output. How can we get students to sound like musicians, artists, chemists, engineers? And this is the, the, the system for that. We'll work, we'll work on, for the next 20 minutes, on each, each one of these very quickly. Okay? And then my other sessions will be about some of them. So let's start with the engineering assessments first. There are two types, knowledge-based assessments where you have to sit down and take tests, and then this performance-based assessment such as a long-term project where you have to uh, produce something at the end. It's not a sit-down test. Let's look at actual exams. This is, I work in an IB school, and this is an actual exam from grade seven ecosystems. This is what might prevent students from not fully demonstrating understanding. Turn and talk to your partners okay. with this exam.
OK, thank you. Let me get your attention back in five. Born by song. Thanks. So you saw vocabulary is high, things were unfamiliar, and this is what I did. Click. Yes, yes, this is what I did. I sat with the teacher and I said, oh, okay, I don't understand what these are, I'm gonna add images, is that okay? Sure, not add images, he's really receptive. And I'm like, oh, the kids don't know what decrease and increase are, can I add the arrows so kids understand? Okay, not a problem, he's really receptive. I know some of you don't work with as receptive teachers, but that's okay, we'll work there. So I added images, added icons. I added the words, the word remove, I said taken away. So I didn't take the word, the word removed away because it's academic, I just added a synonym for students to understand it more, right? So energy transfer, so here are the, we continue to look at the test and here are the examples. Um, and then I said, how can I scaffold this more? And I added a sentence starter for kids. Here's a, here's a trick, I teach students to do something called sentence mirroring. You use the words in the question in your answer. For my beginners, I give them sentence starters like this. The energy enters the food web through the, but for my experienced multilinguals, I teach them strategies so they can be independent. We want them to be dependent upon strategies and not dependent upon us, right? And so I teach them that. Again, teach students to uh, respond on a state test with sentence mirroring. And here is an example from grade nine. These are purple words are the words I do not translate because they were taught explicitly. And then this is what I did for my other students. I have 14 nationalities in that one particular class, but I'm only translating unfamiliar words that uh, students were not explicitly taught. But I only chose three languages of the students that needed the most. Not 14 languages, because then it would be really difficult to read. Right? Here's what I did here. Here's a multi-part question. Describe climate change and its implications. Students read this, and they do just the end, or they do just the beginning. So what you do is you break up the question. And I broke up the question for my teacher. Describe climate change, student response. Explain the implications, the effects of climate change. Right? Not taking the word implications out, but adding another word that I'm more familiar with. Right? Again, I know that what you're saying, wait, but on state tests, we won't have this. I said, yes. So teach them to deconstruct a question. When they see the word and, they need to separate into two things. Right? Your kids can do this. So assessments are equitable. Equitable assessments in content classes assess content. They are not reading and writing tests. And that's why we at some of our class, that's cute, thank you. <laughs> so um, by the way, this is what I took all of these course, I took these three like foundational texts this, um, for teacher collaboration. I'm gonna be having a session in 145 at 315 and then getting on a plane right away to go back to Cambodia to teach on Monday. Whew, yeah. I know. So these three books are foundational in, um, in my teaching. The last one just came out. It's by Dr. Holly Porter from Colorado. She took an entire school district from pull-out instruction to co-teaching. She has eight years of empirical data to show that it's been successful. And she wrote it in a book. That's the last book. So I will show you um, ways to get your teachers to win, to win, to win their trust. Let's move to the next part, to the sun part, comprehensive input. For those who were coordinators yesterday, we already did the tree with the lesson planning template. Uh, the sun part is the comprehensible input. Comprehensible input is making ideas, understandable, presentations, videos, articles. I'm modeling for you what I'm doing to make it comprehensible as well, lots of visuals. But not just visuals. So here's an example. I wanted my sixth grade students to read about um, subsidence, land subsidence in Bangkok, because I was teaching in Bangkok at the time, making culture relevant. I found this fabulous article that was on a ninth grade reading level, but they are sixth graders. So without simplifying this text, what could teachers do to make this text more comprehensible? Turn and talk to your partners. Students can decode, by the way. My students in my class can decode. What can they do? What can you do to make this text more comprehensible? Turn and talk to your partners.
Okay, thank you. Five, four, by two, one. Thank you, thank you. So I just want to first, before I show you what I did, I just want to show you the linguistic complexity of the sentence. For more than or less than the 10 million people thriving in Thailand's capital city of flooding is a common and reoccurring. Right, really complex. By the way, I just wanted to show you how I read with my students when we read out loud. Because I'm reading out loud and they're like, but I have to pause and make sure they understand. But it's not every other word. It's just like one or two words that are really important. Okay? So this is what I did. This is adapted from the amazing Dr. Billings and Dr. Walkie. And we engineered the text. Look at this, the same sentence. It's the same text. I just now added a guiding question for these paragraphs. I then added synonyms after the academic words. For the words reoccurring, I said repeating. For the words phenomenon, I said event. For the words low-lying terrain, flat area without limits, or well, hills are hills. I added a picture to show there were flat hills, no, um, no mountains. I added a, a caption for my beginners. I have a beginner in my class, so as my kids were reading that, I'm sitting with this one beginner, re helping him read this text. For my other kids, there's a recording of the text, reading it to them. I'm not doing more work. I don't have 12 different versions of this. I have one version with that scaffolded in, right? Now, if you don't have time, you can use AI. I know, you're like, whew, this is what I did, ready? At 1.46 this morning, because I woke up at, nine, at 11, and I stayed up until 3, because then jet lagged. Um, I asked, please, well, and when you jet lag, what else are you going to do? Think about your presentation. So what are you going to do? We work it. OK, please write this text at grade level 6. I copied the text and pasted it into Poe. And this is the sentence. Look at the rigor that still remains, but it's still accessible. Bangkok, the capital city of? It's an appositive. It's complex. It's staying there. Bangkok, the capital city of Thailand, is facing a serious problem. It is sinking fast. This is because of a few reasons. First, Bangkok is located in a low-lying area with an average elevation of only 0.5 meters. I strategically stop at a statistic because when they write, they're going to have to write about a statistic in their text. I'm intentional. Everything's intentional. Okay. Uh, meters above sea level. Second, the city is built on soft clay, which makes it more prone to sinking. Again, do you see the complexity here? It's the, it's the positive behind. Or it's the, um, there's a subordinate conjunction. There's a, a clausal phrase. It's really complex. See, it's 1.46 in the morning. I really did this at 1.46. I just want to show you November 14, 13, 12, and 12. This is when we talked about communism simplified, Nazi education, World War I context, World War II cause. This is me showing you when I go to as a grade 8 social studies class. I'm sitting with my kid because the teacher wants them to know about communism. And I'm like, they can't read this text. Let me ask Poe to tell me what communism is. And then they don't understand the Nazi education because they have to read this gigantic text and they can't get through it. So I just found a really accessible uh, summarization for them. Right? And that's what I did. Here's another example of comprehensible input. This is, I'm having my students currently right now, they're learning about social media and its implications, both negative and positive. Look inside the text. I taught students to Google translate words they don't know. Again, it's teaching them to be independent and not dependent upon me to translate everything. Right? And then I teach them to annotate the text. This is October 17th. See, this is like really happening now. So my students first trans uh, annotated in her first language, which is Korean. And then I asked her, can you please translate for me very quickly what they mean Google Translate? Done. So that when I go reassess to just to, to see formative data, it's there. Then I teach students, again, something else. I, teach, I take the text that's really difficult. In the text, there's a sentence. I take it out, and I have students try to remake the sentence. Here's a sentence here. According to a survey conducted by the Pew Research Center, 97% of teens use social media platforms such as YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or Snapchat. I told them, I'm going to take out the word according to, and I'm going to scratch out the word conducted. Your job is to rewrite this sentence with the same idea. 
can you please do this now? Turn and talk to your partners. Rewrite that first sentence without the words con according to and the word conductive. Go. Okay, perfect. Let me show you the example for so my students. Ready? Oh, my students that I'm going to show you, they're at phase three. Some are phase four. Okay. So Pew Research Center presented that 97% of teens are using social media. Another group, and they're co-writing this together in two teams because I had three different groups. Not three. I just put them in groups, and so they're co-writing together. So they're talking like you are, and one person's typing. The person who is giving the idea doesn't type. The person who didn't give the idea, they type. So they're actively processing. Okay. Here's another one. The survey conducted by the Pew Research Center shows that 97% of teens who use social media, such as YouTube, face da 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 da, and they added it in text citation. This is what I mean when, when we're teaching kids to read complex text. We're showing them that, we, that if they can take a, if we can take a really difficult sentence and ask them to restructure it. When they see it in their text in the future, they'll be able to understand it. And they'll be able to write like this as well. So it's all integrated. At 11.15 to 12.15, I'll be doing this. It's called Integrated Reading and Writing for our MLs from grades 4 to 12 for kids who know how to decode. If your kids don't know how to decode, not the best session for you. Okay? That's my five-minute warning. Okay? Uh, and I have to, this has taken me 16 years to try to figure out this point right now. I have taken the best research from vocabulary instruction to the knowledge gap to reading instruction to writing instruction to um, academic work, academic discussions, and um, just re literacy in general. I have taken it and put them into one system, and I'm trying to. I'm practicing it. I'm playing it with with my students. I'm trying to apply it because I don't have time. Teachers don't have time to read seven books, and then try to put it together. So that's why Beth and I are going to write the second book in the future about this. It's specifically for teachers who have students who are, no, who are not beginners, who have an EOD class. Raise your hand if you are one of those. You have your EOD class, just your kids. Yes. This book is for you. Okay? It's in the future. It's being written now. Woo. Woo. So last one, fruit. Okay. Comprehensible output. This is what I'm doing. Comprehensible output is expressing ideas academically, oral, written, or visual. Here's an example from art class. When I co-teach with my teachers, I ask them, show me what you want the kids to do. We look at it, and, and I ask, Did, tell me where kids, what, what are your expectations? We figure it out, and we're like, OK, this is what we should do. I added sentence starters like this. The vantage point of this piece is to make the viewers feel because. I didn't know that as an artist, but my artist teacher knows that. So this is the phrase, when you work with teachers, you have to ask them this. What do you want them to say or write by the end of this class? They will tell you, you listen to the sentence starters, and you write it down for kids. That's it. Okay. Here's another example. This is PE. Look at this class. Look at the last one. What component of fitness does your skill require the most? And then I restructured it this way. You ready? Explain. Instead of the word what, we want students to know command terms or um, thinking verbs. Because they're on a state standardized the test, they're going to be asked not questions, they're going to be asked command terms. They have to know what explain is. Explain what, which component, Khmer in Chinese, of fitness does your school require? Require is translated for them the most. The components are, again, blank, 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 blank. I'm eliminating the cognitive, the cognitive load of trying to remember them. I don't identify as pretty low. We want you to explain. Here they are again. Can you please explain? You don't have to think about what they are again. Okay. Whew, two more minutes. Here's what you do. This is an example of a grade 10 class. Look at the sentence. In order to it's grade 10 science, in order to raise funds for your com company, you need to convince your investors that your ideas are techn technologically possible, that there is the demand for them, and that they will make a profit on investment. My kid was like, my student was like, I don't, what? I don't understand this. Because it's a gigantic sentence, which is fine, but we want to teach students that when they see this on a state standardized test or in another class, every time there's a comma, 
that's a, that's, a, that's a meaning task. So I told my students to, every time in a comma, stop and add a little box and write in what that box is asking for you to do. For example, where it says, um, are things that people cannot do currently? Then she wrote it in. Convince your investors that the ideas are technology possible. Then she found the research. Um, and there's a demand for them. And then she found the research there. Right? Breaking it down explicitly. Teaching students how to do this. Here's another example, and before I end. Here's a country report, like you're, you're, you want your kids, students to do a country report. Identify the subtopics first, name them, and then write the prompts or guiding questions for students. Geography, politics, economy, but don't do this. Location, climate. Instead, say geography, location, identify the hemispheres, identify the content. Climate, what is the advantage average temperature, what are the seasons? When do they occur? Describe the conditions during these conditions. Look how clear that is. Now students can be successful, right? You can take, uh, this is a screenshot of like my lesson planning template. Uh, you'll get the slides in a minute, but this is a screenshot where Beth and I was like, how do we plan? How do we have content teachers plan with SIUP and WIDA without being SIUP and WIDA trained? Right? And this is what it's like. So if you remember nothing else, there are two closing phrases that I want you to leave you with. This is by Brene Brown. Clear is kind. Everything we're doing is not lowering the task for students, lowering the rigor. We're just making things clearer. And when things are clearer, they're kinder. And the last one by Sir Ken Robinson, farmers and gardeners know you cannot make a plant grow what you can do is provide the conditions for growth. Jim, let me show you this video. I had a ninth grade English teacher named Sheila Spicer who changed my life with three words. She said, you can write. Now, well, listen, this woman changed my life, told me I could write. She said to me, I'm going to put you in the honors class. She tried to get me in there. I had a conflict. She said, here's what I'm going to do. She said, I'm going to sit in the, you're going to sit in the corner for the entire year, ignore everything I do on the blackboard. You're going to do the honors work instead. And what she was really saying was, you're going to thank me later. And 10 years later, when my first book came out, I went back to her classroom. I knocked on the door. I said, my name is Brad Meltzer. I wrote this book, and it's for you. And she starts crying. I'm like, why are you crying? She said, you know, I was going to retire this year because I didn't think I was having an impact anymore. And I'm like, are you kidding? You have 30 students. We have one teacher. And sometimes you don't even realize your impact on other people. This woman changed my life, had no idea of her impact on my life. You know, you, you have someone, I'm sure, who took first chance, you give you your first chance. Everyone listening now has someone who took a chance and I'm told them they were good at something for the first time. Everyone has somebody in their life like that. And when you're done listening here, uh, go thank them. You won't believe what comes from it. Just go say thank you. Everybody has someone who took a chance on them. I believe that you are the people who take chances on your students. Or not, you wouldn't be here. As an immigrant person, I, I'm so happy to be here in Minnesota to learn that it's one of the states that I think it receives the most immigrants, in particular refugees, like me. Right? So it's a compliment to your, to your state. On behalf of them, there is a future for them. And the future is bright. And because you have created conditions for them to thrive and be bright. So thank you so very much. Have a great conference.